Hi everyone, my name is Tiffany. Welcome to another video. I am a school psychologist and today we're going to talk about the differences between school psychs and clinical psychs. Um, since I'm not really an expert in clinical psychology, I have a special guest with me. We have Philip here and I'm actually going to let him introduce himself. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, Tiffany. I really appreciate the opportunity. Uh, I know that this is something that I've been looking forward to uh, in talking about these differences. So yeah, I'm a clinical psychology doctoral student, uh, specifically Psy-D. I'm in my third year, so I'm one year away from applying to my internship. Uh, but I love what I'm doing in terms of clinical psychology. I do a lot of different things related to testing and therapy and assessment. Uh, but overall, that's kind of what I do right now. So we'll jump right into it. And I want to start with talking about the different role and function of each career because you know, what you just described, it sounds like a lot of things that I've been trained to do, and I think a lot of people have similar questions. So I'll start with the role and function of a school psychologist, and then maybe um, you can kind of describe yours, and we can talk about maybe some of the similarities and differences. So school psychologists are specialists in the school building or district um, with expertise in learning, behavior, mental health, and school systems. So we'll do some testing for kids for special education, we'll consult about interventions, help directly with behavior, and provide counseling. Um, but there's also so much more. There's so many hats that we wear. Yeah, I, I think that's a great description. And I find a lot of similarities even with clinical psychology. I would say there's, yeah, there's three main things that clinical psychologists do. One of them is related to therapy. And so the two main forms of therapy that we have training on is your traditional cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, as well as psychodynamic therapy. And then there's other forms of therapy that you can learn through your clinical rotations, things like DBT, uh, dialectical behavior therapy or other just forms of therapy. And then the second thing I would say is related to psychological evaluations or testing, kind of like you were talking about with school psychology. One of the things that I did in my first practicum site was that we would do neuropsych testing. And so we would test for different disorders like ADHD, dementia, dyslexia. And then of course we do diagnosing for different mental health disorders by using the DSM as well. And then I would say the last thing is that there's a lot of clinical psychologists that do teaching and research. And so there's a lot of clinical psychologists that are just in academia, they're just doing research, they're teaching doctoral students. And so they may have more of that kind of uh, functional teaching role uh, versus the clinical role. So that's what I would say in terms of a clinical psychologist. I think when it comes to higher ed, um, it sounds pretty similar. You know, a lot of people who want to, you know, go into teaching in university, they'll get their PhD or PsyD and then they'll kind of go into that more research focus and teaching focus route. Um, I guess when it comes to the more traditional roles of these psychologists, what do you think is like the main difference between the two? I can think of one huge one, probably like where we work, right? School psychologists are ma mainly limited to the school setting. Yes, absolutely. I, I think that's definitely one that I think about as well. I would also say too, with clinical psychology, it's been interesting because there is, there does seem to be a potential for if psychologists wanted to, they could prescribe. And so uh, that would just include additional certifications. And it's specific to certain states. Uh, but I think that's one difference that I've seen. Uh, I think another difference too, is perhaps maybe in uh, perhaps consulting or organizational roles. Uh, there's a lot of clinical psychologists who I've seen who are, that maybe they do consulting for uh, different marketing uh, companies or organizations, or they do a lot of uh, administrative roles in terms of uh, supervising clinical directors and things like that. So I think those are some of the, maybe the key differences that I can think of. Yeah, in general, it just sounds like there's like a broader scope of practice for, for a clinical psychologist. Can you work with all ages? Maybe that's another reason why. Yes, yeah. And honestly, it's it's so interesting because when I got into graduate school, there's like, you really can kind of make it your own. There's a lot of students in my cohort who just want to work with kids. And what they're doing is that they're primarily choosing clinical sites that just work with children. And they're going to most likely after their program specialize in child psychology. So they'll probably become board certified in working with uh, either child psychology or pediatric psychology. And then there's other people who are just working with geriatric populations. And so they're working with the elderly populations. And so I think there's a lot of different things that someone can do based on their preferences. 
And I've also seen psychologists work with the lifespan. So from young kids to teenagers, to adults, to elderly. So I would, I would definitely say that as well in terms of what someone wants to work with is perhaps something that they might be able to do based on their preferences and being able to get those clinical experiences while they're in graduate school. So we're going to jump into education and degrees. I think a lot of people watching this, they're probably considering the different career paths and education is going to be a huge part of that, right? Like what kind of programs do I apply to and what's available? Yeah, absolutely. So I don't know, for me, it was so confusing trying to figure out with clinical psychology what to go into because there's two main theories of thought. So I'm a clinical psychology PsyD student, but you could also become a clinical psychology PhD student. So there's PhD programs and PsyD programs. They're both really similar uh, in terms of the education experience. They might have some differences in training, but ultimately we take the same licensure exam. We get hired by the same different facilities. We can treat the same populations. The big difference between PhD is of course, they are kind of more focused on research and then CIDES programs are focused a little bit more on clinical practice. So I've noticed for me, even when I'm in my practicum sites, I'm, there might be PhD students there as well. And we'll compare some of the similarities and the, and the differences. And they always talk about how much more research that they have to do, more statistic courses that they have to take. And it also depends on the school because there could be PsyD programs that do a lot of research as well. But I also think too that PhD programs tend to be more funded and PsyD programs, if you look online, the, the amount of student loan debt that PsyD students have is way more than a PhD student. But also, you know, for PsyD programs, they tend to be a little bit shorter. They tend to be four years and then the internship and then licensure. Whereas there's a lot of PhD programs that are five years of school and then maybe the one year internship and then a few years of postdoc. So in terms of the timeline, in terms of the funding and in terms of the clinical training, that's some of the differences between like different types of programs that you might want to look into. So I would really encourage students to kind of do their research and figure out what they prefer, get a pros and cons list, talk to maybe different students who are in different programs, just to kind of see what you might, what you might be into. Those, I mean, I think you brought up some really, really good points. Um, I have a couple questions. So if students have a lot of questions and they don't really know where to start, do you have any resources that might be helpful for them? Yes, yeah, absolutely. I, that's a great question. So uh, on my YouTube channel, I provide a lot of uh, different YouTube videos related to some of these differences because they, can be, they can be confusing. Like there's even different training thoughts of like, the scholar practitioner model and the, the, the practitioner scholar model. There's all, all these different differences. And so my YouTube channel kind of talks about those differences a little bit more in depth. And then uh, one thing that I'm trying to do is that I'm trying to create more uh, like PDF files uh, for people to check out with clinical psychology. So I have a PDF file on my website that has all like a lot of clinical psychology questions for people uh, when they go into their interviews and they're looking to have different topics to talk about with the person that's interviewing them. So those are probably the two main resources is my YouTube channel and then my website might have some additional PDF things that you can download and, and check out. Awesome. And I can link those in the description box for everyone. Oh, perfect. <laughs> um, one last quick question about education. Is there like a board certification for each like specialty? That, yeah, that is such a good question. So it's interesting in the field, most clinical psychologists, after they go through their program, they do their one year internship, depending on what state that they live in, they're probably going to do a one year postdoc. And that postdoc after that, they'll go into their licensure. So it's a long process. It's about, you know, four, probably around five to eight years total. Uh, so it does take a while. That's but after undergrad, right? <laughs> That's after undergrad. Yeah, it's crazy. So then if they want to, like most psychologists are not board certified because after you go through your program, your internship, your postdoc and your licensure, you're good to go. Like most, I would say over 80% of psychologists are not board certified in any type of specialty. They, once they get their licensure, they pick a place and then they just do what they do. Now, for things like neuropsychology or health psychology or pediatric psychology, there are 
tons of different specializations that they could get board certified, but it's not a requirement. And I think even now it's really, it's just not common right now. In 10, 15, 20 years, it may be more common for psychologists to go get board certified, but at least for right now, uh, it's not a huge necessity. And there's not that big of a difference in most of the specialties in terms of someone who's not board certified and someone who is, there may be a little bit of a salary increase or maybe a little bit more opportunities. So it really kind of just depends on the student. But overall, in general, board certification process is going to be it's going to be more laid back in terms of you presenting a clinical case to a panel. Uh, they ask you a bunch of different questions. You might have to take a test or an exam um, online, and then they may just uh, they may just give more of like an oral exam to you. And so that's kind of more of the board certification format for all the different specialties. Okay, great. I had no idea. Like. Yeah, I'm like learning so much right now. Um, I'll just quickly go over the school psych, um, I guess, education and degrees. And I have a ton of content out there. I will put it in the cards. Um, I, I think I have a video about how to become a school psychologist and also specifically talking about the different degrees. Um, so you can practice in the US with either an EDS or an equivalent in EDS or a, a doc, a doctorate degree. Um, an EDS takes around three years, and that includes the one-year internship, which is typically paid like a stipend, um, but there are places that don't pay, and there are places that pay a full salary. Um, and then the doctorate route, it's going to take five to six years. Um, and, I mean, the pay might not be that different in the school setting, but you have a lot more options, I guess, practice-wise. You know, you can work in um, higher education. You can maybe open your own practice without as many limitations. So it does open up more opportunities. I wanted to add, like, you bring up such a good point about the internship, because even for us, too, there are, if you go through, there's ma there's two main board certification, like, or not board certification, but just general certifications. There's the APA, American Psychological Association, and then I think it's the Canadian Association as well. And they prefer like their students to go through an APA certified internship, which usually is paid. But if you don't get an APA approved internship, you have to at least find some other internship and those may not be paid. So there's a lot of conversations going on right now about like sort of the ethics behind that. And even like as a clinical psychology student, I'm not paid in my practicum sites, right? I'm not paid in my clinical rotations. So there's a lot of conversations going on about just, just the need uh, to pay students because we are doing so much work. And I think it's interesting as with school psychology as well, you guys have some of those similarities as well. Yeah, it's a shame. I think it's such a dis disservice to the field and all the clients. Um, it's like a privilege to go to grad school. It's crazy. It's crazy. Absolutely all right. Crazy. Um, oh, okay. One last question. Um, are there clinical psychology degrees that are like master's level or specialist level? Great question. So in general, at least in the United States, you could, you could get a master's degree in clinical psychology, but you wouldn't be able to practice independently. You'd have to practice under uh, the supervision of a, a licensed psychologist. So you could see patients and you probably could find work, but you would never be able to get a private practice or be independent. I know in other countries, that's a little bit different that if they get a master's in clinical psychology, they can practice independently, but at least for right now in the US, uh, you would not be able to practice independently. So we'll kind of talk about the work setting. I feel like we've already kind of touched upon this, but you know, the, the populations that we work with, the clientele, um, for school psychologists, a majority will work in schools. Some might work in like juvenile detention centers, hospitals, private practice. Some might have to work under licensed psychologists, but in certain states, um, even with just a specialist degree, you can have your own private practice. It really depends on what the you know, rules and regulations are for each um, state. Um, and then those with um, doctorates might have more opportunities to work in higher education or do doing research um, and probably more like supervisory roles as well. For us, it's, yeah, it, it's based on your, your preference or what site that you kind of get into in terms of uh, your clinical rotations. 
So uh, there's a psychologist at work with uh, young, old, uh, different ethnicities, different places. Right now, for me, my first site was in the neuro site, and I was working predominantly just with kids and ages from four to 18, and that was great. But now I'm in a, a medical setting, and I'm working with more so adults from the ages of like 30 to 65. Uh, and then I have people in my cohort who are just mainly working with the geriatric, older, elderly population. So it, it is based on what your preference is. There's also people who work with lifespan in terms of ages uh, and in terms of different environments. There's private practice, there's hospital, there's academic medical centers, there's mental health community centers. So there's a lot of different places. And I feel like I've been seeing a lot more places pop up in terms of adding mental health to their facilities or to their organizations. Uh, obviously, I think of even school counseling centers related to college campuses and universities. So it's, uh, it's, yeah, it's growing in terms of the opportunities to work with different populations and work in different settings. That's so cool to me, just, yeah. you know, thinking about the different, all the different populations that you guys get to work with. Yeah, it's, it's kind of overwhelming too, because it's like, some, some, for me, sometimes I feel like, it, it was one thing working with kids and I got used to working with kids and I was like, oh, this is great. And then I got switched to working with adults and uh, obviously adults are, are different than working with kids. I so thought you were going to say more difficult. <laughs> <laughs> Both. Yeah. <laughs> different and difficult. And so it's, it's just like a, it's a learning curve, you know, in terms of all of the different populations that you might work with, but it definitely does keep you on your toes, which is good. Awesome. We're going to jump into the pay or salary for each career. Um, when you look on Google for school psychologists, the median is $78,000. But of course, there's like a huge range, you know, depending on cost of living, what state, like what is your role? And you also have to consider how many months you're working. Typically, a contract is around 10 months. You know, you have your summer break and winter break, spring break amazing it's a huge perk of working in the school system but you know somewhere like northern california the starting will be six figures you're going to get over a hundred thousand dollars starting but that's because it's so expensive to live there whereas somewhere in the midwest it might be like 45 which is that's that's kind of scary <laughs> especially for all the money and training um everything that you sacrifice to you know get into this field it's a shame yeah, I would totally, yeah, I, I I, would definitely agree with that as well. I think even in the clinical psychology world, what I've noticed, yeah, there's so much differences in terms of what state that you live in. I've. It's also been interesting to see how like, even with mental health counselors who have just a master's degree, the potential for them to make just as much as a clinical psychology in certain situations too, uh, that's also been interesting. And so when I looked at the specific salary, it was around 88 to like 98,000 a year. Uh, I saw that academic positions, so professors who were tenured, who also, let's say they were in academia doing research and teaching for three days, and then they would do two days of their own clinical private practice work. They ha had numbers, you know, in the 150s, uh, so a little bit more than that, uh, more than that average. And then uh, VAs, VA medical centers, academic medical centers tended to have higher salaries too, anywhere in the 100, 100,000 range as well. I know that uh, when it comes to private practice, there's such a huge range, right? Because then you can charge what you, what you want in terms of that. But then insurance is also interesting too. And I'm sure for school psychology in terms of um, I haven't been in a situation where I've had to specifically deal directly with insurance, but I've obviously working in a private practice, I've seen it in the background and some of the challenges there in terms of fighting for basically fighting for getting what you're owed and what you're doing and what you've been taught and that not being reciprocated. Right. And so there's, so there's definitely some issues there, but overall, that's what I've been able to see so far. I would imagine the range for clinical psychology to be even crazier because you can do so many different things like private practice even. I mean, it really depends on, are you good at business <laughs> and like what kind of like yeah. clients you have and do right. you have people who work under you? It's just, there's, yeah, so many factors. 
Yeah. And it's even been cool to see, like, I know there's some psychologists that do consulting work on the side. And so they consult for different, uh, whether it's marketing companies or for different work organizations or in the HR department and so, or speaking events too. Right. And so, uh, I, I think it's cool that there's, there's an aspect of being entrepreneurial. If a student is interested in that, that is there, but yeah, such a huge range in terms of the salary. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know if our answer was very helpful, but you know, at least people know that there is a big range, and you know, you can really go and do your research, and it depends on where you live. So maybe you can reach out to people in your area and get clearer answers. Yeah, and one thing I've realized too is that there's a lot more virtual positions mm -hmm. like uh, that have been popping up, especially because of the pandemic. And so I've heard of people, um, you know, like taking California salary positions, but then living somewhere in like the Midwest or that's like super cheap. Right. And so there, there might be some ways to, to be able to kind of maximize that salary benefit if you can get a virtual position. I didn't too. even think about that, <laughs> but yeah, no, I, I know people who have virtual positions even as school psychologists. So yeah, that's a great point. So I have a bonus topic. This one's about how we can kind of advocate for social justice. Um, in our, our fields. And I honestly don't know how, like what answer you have prepared for this, but mm. I guess I'll start off by saying the different things that you can do in schools. You know, you have so much reach when you're working in a school setting because you're working with so many children, especially if, if you have multiple school sites and you have all the staff members and you're also part of a district and a community. So mm. you have potential to do a lot of great work. Of course, like it could be very daunting. Um, people might not like you, but ultimately you should be there for your students. Some things that I've done um, in the past few years, um, we've had like small groups, like small, small group counseling or clubs for marginalized groups. This year we started something called Rainbow Alliance. I'm in the middle school and so we did get a little bit of pushback in the beginning because it's been a hot button topic in this area but we just saw that the need was so great and we know that the lgbtq plus population especially for teenagers the mental health aspect is so big and there's a lot of data backing up that they need support um, and if school is a safe place for them and a safe place to receive the support i'm here for it um Another thing that you can do in schools is really highlighting and celebrating different groups. So whether it's like Black History Month or um, Hispanic Heritage Month, for me, I'm really passionate about the AAPI community. And so last year, I was pretty upset when my school didn't do anything. <laughs> and so like, I think it was um, the middle of the month, I think it's May, and I was like, wow, they're really not doing anything. And so I went out, um, reached out to my principal, I was like, hey, like, I realized like, you're not doing anything like can we do something i'm gonna make my own video we can show it like in the announcements we still have like a 10 percent like asian population which probably makes them feel even more marginalized <laughs> and um we shot to the library and then they gathered some like um asian american authors um they highlighted that so i'm hoping this year we can do something bigger and greater you can also provide parent training um, about certain topics even like the language language that you use during meetings or while you're having conversations, I find that really, really important because um, it could really change the perspective of this, the student that you're talking about, the situation, and that kind of goes hand in hand um, with just providing, like being an advocate for students. Those are really good. I really love the point that you made about uh, just supporting the LGBTQ in the school settings. I actually, uh, the medical center that I work in, they were actually doing a presentation to all of the training staff, medical staff, about how important it was for them to use appropriate pronouns and to just be well-versed in the literature. So it wasn't just for mental health professionals to know that, but also medical professionals mm -hmm. to know that. And that a lot of people, I mean, safety is an issue, right? And And support is an issue. And so, Anytime that you are part of an institution, if you can do anything to really support those who are marginalized, that's a really big thing uh, in terms of them feeling supported and feeling heard and, uh, and advocating for that. So that was just something that I thought about when you when you mentioned that. But I would say a lot of the same things I was, you know, when I was thinking about this question, 
I was thinking about it also from just the aspect of us as mental health professionals and how since I've been in this profession, I've seen a lot of psychologists who are burnt out mm. and who are just emotionally fatigued. And I just think it's so interesting that we're trying to advocate for people's mental health and supporting them in their self-care you know, journeys, but we're not giving it to ourselves and we're not preaching to ourselves and we're not you know, showing that in our practice and modeling that. And I just feel like if you have an empty cup, you know, how in the world are you going to like, how in the world are you going to advocate for someone else if you're just empty in terms of being able to do that or even having the energy to do that? And so I, I think there has to definitely be a, a place for that, for our profession. And then I was even thinking about like how for like this profession, right? There's already a small percentage of minorities, racial ethnic minorities. And like, I think in clinical psychology, it's like 4% or less than that are African-Americans. And it's really hard to advocate, for example, for a marginalized population, if your medical or mental health professional staff or whatever doesn't, you know, have that same type of representation. And so just the importance of whatever we need to do to go into those communities, those marginalized communities, and just have them exposed to mental health, right? Uh, in terms of advocating for mental health, but also for students in elementary or uh, even in high school who are thinking about their careers, for them to have opportunities to shadow mental health professionals, to learn about mental health. I didn't really even know what a clinical psychologist was until I got to college. I didn't even know that they existed. And so I wonder what would have happened if I had known that in high school and I was like, just, you know, researching the profession. So yeah, just being able to advocate for that in terms of representation and then really just being a voice to the voiceless because there's so many, so many issues that come up. I'm thinking about just, yeah, with the pandemic and all of the racial injustice. And then even the research showed how like uh, with Asian Americans, they suffered a lot more racism and discrimination because of the virus. So I, and I saw a lot of mental health professionals speaking up about that and doing research on that. And so just continuing that, because I think sometimes like for, for those who are marginalized, like they, they really may not have a voice. And for us, I think we're in a really unique position because we're like oriented to listening. Like most of other professions, like I think about politics, it's all about <laughs> talking, right? Mm -hmm. It's all about like, the ego and like for us as therapists or a psychologist like we're in very much this listening role and i and i love that because i feel like we get to learn a lot about people through that but then on the at the same time it's like okay what do we do with that information and how do we go out into the communities and voice what we've been hearing in therapy mm -hmm. like to other organizations and really kind of bringing that change to so yeah those are some of my thoughts with that wow those are amazing and I, yeah, I agree. I, like representation is so important. I just, yeah, like self-care. <laughs> yes. Oh my gosh. I was so surprised. Like I was like in my graduate school, I was like, dang, everybody's burnt out. <laughs> in grad school. But, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And like, and then, it, but it's so interesting because like for me, there you build this environment of, of cultivating an atmosphere that is just wanting to get burnt out, right? Like working super hard. Mm -hmm. And so if you don't, if you don't see that modeled, then you're not going to advocate it for yourself. It's just, it's just interesting. Like the ways that I've seen that. Yeah. We can probably talk about this for so long. <laughs> I have so many questions, but I'm going to cut the video here and I'm going to also let people check out your other videos. I'll link them down below. Thank you so much yeah. for being here. This was amazing. Yeah, Tiffany, thank you so much for having me. I really uh, just appreciate the conversation and what you're doing on your channel uh, in terms of all the different information that you're bringing out. I, I, I just think that this was such a great collaboration. So thank you. All right, don't forget to like and subscribe and I will see you guys in the next one. Bye. Bye.